this is the uh, second part of uh, 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 season two in the KU and International Christian University Linguistic Colloquium. And uh, I'm very happy to introduce you to Adam Chong, uh, uh, lecturer, and he kindly wrote its equivalent to assistant professor in the United States uh, on his website uh, in linguistics uh, at Queen Mary uh, University of London. Adam received his uh, PhD from University of California, Los Angeles uh, in 2017. His research interests include wide range, uh, wide range of topics uh, from phonological acquisition and processing, phonological variation, uh, phonology, morphology interface in learning, prosody and international phonology, speech perception, quantitative and computational methods, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe there's no et cetera, but like, uh, that's what it is. Uh, although I didn't formally meet Adam uh, before today, uh, when I looked at his CV, I realized that our course path could have crossed actually multiple times because in uh, recent two ICPHS meetings in Glasgow and Melbourne, I was there, so he was there, so he was somewhere nearby. Or uh, I don't know whether he was at the TAL meeting in Berlin in 2018, but uh, uh, I was there as well, so uh, maybe uh, we had some uh, <laughs> open, uh, we had some opportunities, and uh, today finally we were able to uh, 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 say hello in person. Uh, without further ado, today Adam will share his work titled "Derived Environment Effects of View from Learning." Uh, please share your screen and uh, go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, thanks so much, Sengham, for that introduction. Can I just check that everyone can see the slides? Um, yes, we good? can see. Yeah. OK, great. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks so much for the invitation to this. Um, and I'm happy to share what I'm, um, some work that, that kind of arose from my dissertation. And that's view, something that I've been thinking about going forward. Um, and this is to do with derived environment effects. Um, and what those are, I'll sort of jump into in a second. Um, but before we do that, I kind of just want to zoom out a bit and think about just generally um, the relationship between phonotactics and alternations um, within uh, grammars, right? So um, phonological alternations, so that is to say um, uh, changes to morphemes to, uh, uh, sort of at morphological boundaries often seem to reflect static phonotactic restrictions in the lexicon. So just what kinds of sequences you seem to find um, um, within, within a word, right, or within a morpheme. So, uh, and this is an observation that has gone back um, since to Chomsky and Halley, right? Um, and so a, a typical case might look like this. So uh, this is work from, um, data from Navajo, um, from Martin, but cited originally from Fountain. Um, and so in Navajo, uh, there is a uh, prefix alternation um, that, that enforces harmony um, in terms of sibilant uh, place, right? And particular anteriority. So, so the relevant features here are in, in red, right? So the prefix s um, also sort of says sort of s when it's attached to a, a verb with um, the same feature, um, but it alternate the, the 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 it alternates to match and feature um, in interiority. So if there's in this case sh, uh, when the root itself has um, has this uh, a sibilant of the same quality, right? So this is a fairly well-known sibilant harmony pattern, um, and this sort of general alternation, right, um, seems to reflect the fact that within roots, um, siblings are, have to be um, of the same type, right? So, you, uh, so here are some um, attested examples, right, where uh, the siblings within a root, and in this case also affricates, right, share the same feature for interiority, um, and, and sort of analogous examples that uh, mismatch in interiority don't exist, right? So in this case, this is a case where um, both the generalization that you get at the phonological boundary, at the morphological boundary, right, seems to be the same as what you get within the lexicon, right? So it's the same generalization holds, right? Um, and this kind of, this observation, right, um, sort of led or was one of the main impetuses for uh, the development of constraint-based models uh, in the early 1990s, um, primarily because within these models, these generalizations um, are captured using the same constraint. Right? So the observation that actually functionally they seem to be doing the same thing. But 
uh, this is obviously not always the case. So, so sometimes static phono pa patterns mismatch with alternation patterns at their morphological boundaries. And there are two ways, at least two ways in which this can play out. And I, and I would direct you to past through 2013 for kind of other cases, but two um, ways which, which sort of stick out. And the first is where there might be an active alternation, right? But where there is no actual support from stem phonotactics. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a case in a second, right? But this is, this is known in the literature as morphologically derived environment effects, so DEEs, right? And this has been around for a long time. Uh, it's also known as non-derived environment blocking, um, so, so they go by both names. I'm going to use the term uh, or the phrase DEE, so derived environment effects for today's talk. Um, so in this case, as I said, there's an active alternation. There's some kind of fix that goes on at the morphological boundary. Um, but really, there's something going on with the phonotactics that doesn't really support this. Um, the reverse is also true. So uh, there are many languages that show um, sort of ostensibly some kind of stem phonotactic restrictions on the co-occurrence of sounds, um, but this doesn't actually engender any active alternation, right? So that even though you, you get this sort of mismatches across the morphological boundary. Um, laryngeal co-occurrence restrictions in many languages, so um, sort of on, on the co-occurrence of different kinds of voice or uh, different kinds of stops, for example, right, seems to be one candidate for this kind of general pattern. So diving into derived environment effects, which are going to be the main uh, subject of today's talk. So here's an example of that's quite well known in the literature. So this is Turkish vowel harmony. Um, so in, in, Tur in Turkish, suffixes agree with the final vowel of the stem in vacuous. Um, so in this case, it's simple. This is a, you know, if you go into any first year phonology class or even first year intro class, this is a pattern that might be, um, you might expect to see, right? Um, the, the plural here, the vowel in the plural just matches or alternates to match the, the backness. Um, this is just one part of the system um, of the vowel in the stem. Uh, but the thing about Turkish, and this is well known, um, is that roots themselves can actually show disharmonic sequences, right? Um, so what, what the generalization that we have across the morphological boundary, right, doesn't seem to quite fit um, with what we actually observe within, um, within roots or within morphemes themselves. Right? Uh, the picture obviously is a little bit more complicated, but, but at the very least, this is kind of the basic pattern. Um, previous theoretical approaches or an analytical approaches to dealing with these kinds of patterns have sought to primarily protect uh, the morpheme internal sequences. So that is to say, in, in, in the uh, Turkish case, you know, protect these root internal disharmonic stems while ensuring that the same sequence um, that occurs across morphological boundaries, right, due to morpheme concatenation, right, alternate, right. So you kind of have your, your, have your pie and eat it, right, in some ways. Um, but this, and this assumes two things, uh, one of which has, I think, received more, much more attention in the literature. Uh, the first is this idea that goes back to Kaparsky, um, this idea of the derived environment condition, that there's something about the morphological context, so the fact that it's a morphologically derived context, that is a necessary and sufficient condition for the process to occur, right? So it's something about the fact that it's morphology, there's morphological stuff going on, that triggers this alternation. Um, and most of the focus of the of, of sort of theoretical work on this has has been on this aspect of it. Um, and more implicitly, though, though with less attention, um, is this idea that um, the, the, the morpheme internal sequences. So going back to the Turkish case, those harmon disharmonic sequences are phonetically well formed, right? So that is to say, uh, they are worthy of being protected in some way, shape, or form, right? Uh, and I, I use well formed as here in, in the sense that um, in the way distinguished from just attestedness, right? Because we know that um, something that is just attested isn't necessarily um, well-formed to the same degree, right? Um, there's also been less explicit examination of these patterns from, from two perspectives, primarily the productivity of these patterns in, the, in, a, in a general sense, uh, what these patterns actually look like under the hood once we actually look more closely at the quantitative patterns within, within the language. Uh, as well as the learnability of these patterns. Um, because as, as I think, um, hopefully I'll show, right, the, the learn, looking at these patterns from the learnability perspective has implications for our models of phonological learning and the relationship between uh, phonotactics and alternations in the grammar. So the goal of my talk today um, is to um, look at these derived environment patterns from two perspectives. Uh, the first is to look at how 
learnable these alternations are, right, um, in these derived environment patterns relative to patterns which um, are more across the board, like the Navajo cases we saw. So really what we're asking is what happens to learning when phonotactics mismatches the alternation. Uh, and related to this, um, how productive, in scare quotes, are, are these patterns? And I, I, I use scare quotes here because productive, productivity usually applies to like actual native speaker intuitions, but I'm not going to be providing that uh, today. It's primarily a sort of a modeling um, data set. Uh, and we're going to be essentially looking at the phonotactic well formulas of stem internal sequences in, in sort of these kinds of cases. Right? So just two case studies. Um, so let's start, start looking at part one. So looking at learning and derived environment effects in the lab. Um, so one reason that, that we might want to look at these patterns is because they actually might have something very broader to say about learning more generally or phonological learning more generally. Um, uh, the influential view within constraint-based theoretical models or, or, and, and therefore models of learning within these models um, is that learning phonotactic knowledge assists with the learning of alternations. Right, and, and the reason for this is, there, there are many reasons for this. One is that phonotactic knowledge can be acquired before knowing morphological, uh, sort of more complex morphological information. Um, it requires potentially, it, it seems to emerge earlier than alternation learning in, in childhood, although that's, the, the timeline is a little murky, it's not completely clear exactly. Right, uh, but certainly from, from, a, from a model perspective, um, within these models, again, as I said previously, um, these types of knowledge are generally assumed to be sh captured by the same shared mechanism, so a single constraint. Right? And so this actually predicts that if, if, if phonotactic knowledge assists alternation le learning, then it actually predicts that in cases that where phonotactics mismatch the alternation, like in a derived environment case, right, that alternation should be, alternation learning should be more difficult to learn. Right? Um, and and bro more broadly speaking, um, there, there isn't really a lot of evidence um, that, that sort of experimental evidence at least that supports the assumption that phonotactics actually aids in alternation learning. There's been sort of a couple of attempts at this, including my previous ones. Um, and, and so the idea here is beyond the narrow look sort of examination of just learning of derived environment effects, but using derived environment effects as a way of actually examining the broader question of how phonotactics and alternations interact in learning, right? Because what we're able to do in this case is to keep the alternation constant, right? But just by manipulating the stem phonotactics, right? Again, if it's a shared mechanism, we might expect to, that derived environment effects might be harder to learn. And this might also then tell us something about, you know, um, how the grammar and the learning mechanism actually works. So what I'm gonna to present to you today is just a, a single experiment part of a series, but I'm, I'm only gonna have time really to talk about one of these. Um, uh, using artificial grammar learning with adults um, in the lab. Um, so, uh, so a background on artificial grammar learning experiments, um, usually, though this happens with kids as well, these are adults trained on a constructive language, uh, controlling for language background as much as possible. Um, and this allows us to have controlled manipulation of linguistic variables across different miniature languages, right? So it's sort of like, um, I think what Timo was talking about before iterative learning, this is one way of doing it, but on a smaller scale. And we can ask then, given what we've manipulated, what is learned or what is not learned, as the case might be. And this is a good way of probing potential learning biases, right? So if we can, if, can we observe certain things being easier or harder? Um, and how might that then inform our, our models of the grammar or how language might change um, overall? Um, and just on a practical, practical note, it's a really, it's a much cheaper and, and time efficient way of testing your question with adults uh, before examining it with infants, uh, which is kind of where, where I want to go eventually. Of course, there are many caveats to this in the sense of like, you know, the, the usual caveats apply, you know, there's a learning a first language might not involve exactly the same mechanisms as a second. So, so you know, th these all have to be taken with a grain of salt. So, uh, what, do these, what, what does the experiment look like? Um, so we're going to be using um, an artificial, artificial grammar experiment with vowel harmony. Um, so in, in our cases, you'll see the vowel sequences have to agree in backness. So it's really being modeled after the Turkish example. Um, and the reason for this is vowel harmony has been shown to be learnable in the lab as an automation pattern. Um, that is to say, we've, been, we've seen ample evidence that we can set up an experiment where this will work, 
right? Um, but more importantly for us, the static phonotactic pattern is also learnable in the lab. Um, this, this is less clear, clearly the case of many other kinds of static phonotactic patterns in this paradigm. Happy to answer more about that uh, in the question time. Right, so thought harmony basically allows us to kind of examine both of these types of knowledge. So what do these languages look like? Um, these artificial languages uh, involve uh, a sequence of consonants and vowels, right? This is a set that we've, we've chosen, so we're keeping it quite simple. Um, so just a four vowel system. Uh, and so we have two front vowels and two back vowels. And, and because these are English participants, the front are also unrounded and the back are also unrounded uh, to match the English system. Uh, all stems are just single by disyllabic with stress in the initial syllable. Um, and there's a plural suffix, muoni, right? So this is modeled after Finlay and Baddeker's 2009 uh, type stimuli. Um, and in all languages, this is where we can keep it constant, um, the suffix alternates based on the backness of the final vowel of the stem, right? So in a word like pime, the singular, the plural is going to be pime, right? Um, or in a word like tonu, then you get tonu, right? So you get this alternation, as you would expect to say in, in Turkish, right? So this is modeled after, you know, a real life language, so to speak. Um, and the crucial thing is this. Um, the, all languages had a 100% rate of alternations. So we're keeping that constant, right? That is to say, if, if we're able to keep track of alternations and phonotactic separately, then there's, there's, there's ample evidence that, alternation, that the alternation exists, right? Uh, what differs, though, between the languages is a really the proportion of harmonic stems uh, within the language, right? So globally, you kind of have something like this. So this is what happens at the morphem boundaries. So in both languages, the alternations are exactly the same. So you have words like bunu, bunu mu, pime, pime mi, and this is the same across both languages. Uh, really, the difference is in terms of harmonic steps, right? So in the harmonic language, um, you don't get cases like boki, um, which have a mismatch and backness for the vowels. Um, so in the cases where there are in, in the semi and non-harmonic languages, which you'll see in a second, right, the prefix, or the, sorry, the suffix uh, alternates um, to match the final vowel in the stem. So this mod it is modeled after actually what happens in Turkish in reality. So in Turkish as well, um, there is an alternation, but it just matches to the closest vowel, right, so the last vowel. Um, and so just a closer look at what these languages look like sort of within the, the stem phonotactics. Again, as I said, the, at the alternation level, all the languages are the same. That is to say, 100% alternating. Right? The crucial difference really is in terms of stem phonotactics. In the harmonic language, um, there were no non-harmonic stems. In the non-harmonic language, there were 50-50, so there's no, in principle, Right, no, no bias one way or the other. Um, and we were, I was also interested at the time to examine what happens if we have something kind of in between, right? So what happens if we have uh, some bias towards har harmony, but, but not all, right? So this is what the semi-harmonic semi language looks like, right? Um, for the purposes of today, the main comparisons that we're gonna try and kind of concentrate on are, are, are sort of the two extremes. Right. Um, feel free to ask about the semi-harmonic language. Um, it's a bit messier, but, but this is the main, the, the sort of two extremes are the ones that um, we'll focus on primarily today. Um, so what do these experiments look like? Um, so traditionally, these experiments, artificial grammar learning experiments and phonology tend to examine primarily just alternation learning on its own or phonotactic learning on its own. So one of the, the difficulties or uh, things that we've done was try to incorporate both of those aspects into a single experiment. Um, so uh, these, uh, the experiment took place online. These were American English, uh, primarily California and undergraduate students, right? So again, caveats with that, right? Um, tested online using Expression. Um, there was a, broadly speaking, there was a training phase uh, follow it, followed by the first test phase, which was, we, we're going to call this a Blick test, um, uh, where we're testing here, examining ostensibly the stem phonotactics, right? What they, what they learned about stem phonotactics, uh, followed by, um, a traditional ish what test where they had to think about alternations right so and and these were set up in a very similar way except the questions that were they were asked to kind of respond to were slightly different right in one case it was sort of well decide which is the word that belongs to the language you've just learned right this is the blink test which is more traditionally used in this kind of experiments and those kinds of experiments and then in the what test decide on the correct plural of the two options 
we'll go through these um, in, 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 in turn. All right. So what might the training phase look like? Um, so uh, in the training phase, um, participants were instructed that they were going to learn words from a new language. They didn't have to memorize anything, but they just had to kind of learn stuff. Right? Um, unlike some uh, sort of traditional many experiments in this vein, especially with alternation learning, uh, we wanted to make it a little harder for participants to kind of um, and directly learn the alternation. Right? In some ways, we were actually worried that it was going to be too easy. Uh, so instead of presenting singulars and plurals side by side, right, what we did was um, a participant never heard a single and plural on the same trial. Um, so they only heard them across different trials. Right? So it, it, might have, it would have been something like this. Right? So they might have seen, let me see if this is going to work. Uh, yeah. They might have seen, say, a single bird right, and heard the word for this. It's going to hopefully this will play. They may. Right? Hopefully, if not, it was they may. Right? Uh, and then a couple of trusts later, you'll see a single cat or a single leopard, I guess, in this case. Um, right, and heard a different word for it. Tonumu. And there should be a plural in this case, uh, not a singular. But then only after, um, after a couple of trials down, right, might they actually see the plural for um, the word bird that they heard earlier, right? Bememi. Right, so that's the plural version of bememi, which was, say, trials earlier. So the idea is that you're not getting the overt paradigmatic information uh, about the match between them and them and me. It's a harder task in some ways because they have to keep track of this across um, across different um, uh, different tri uh, different trials, right? Uh, and and you know the the idea was maybe that this might mimic a little bit more, right? What what a, a learning environment might be like, right? Um, beyond um, in in a sort of real context, quote unquote. Uh, and, and target words were just paired with objects, everyday objects, like animals, and things like that. Yeah. So th there were 32 uh, sort of singulars and plurals, there were three blocks of trials and so forth. Um, and then after they've completed this, there was, in this case, we didn't have any um, sort of threshold of, of, of learning. We just sort of just said, go ahead, see what happens, right? Um, and then they proceeded on to the first task, which is um, the Blick test after Halley in 1978. And here we're interested in examining primarily sort of stems and knowledge about what kinds of stems exist. Right? Uh, this, was a, this was implemented as a two alternative force choice task. Um, and, and, and feel free to ask me more about why we decided this initially. Um, and so on a single trial, they heard a, a participant would hear two possible single words. Right? One was always harmonic, one was um, non-harmonic, but in this case, no accompanying images. Right? We just wanted to get them to think about which of this is a better word for them, right? given what they've learned. Right? So you might have a pair like Gike and Giko. Gike is harmonic, Giko is non-harmonic. Right? Um, I won't bother playing this because it sounds exactly as you might expect. Right? And they were just asked to decide which word belonged to the language they just learned. Right? And these were all novel words, these ones which they hadn't heard before. Right? So we kind of bypassed the familiar novel in this in this way. So what maybe what me what might we expect? Right? So we expect that the non-harmonic learners, well, one expectation at least, is that they wouldn't really infer any phonotactic constraint, right? So there shouldn't be any strong preference for a harmonic or a non-harmonic word, right? Because there's no strong preference for either of these in the in the lexicon, right? So we expect basically these two should be at roughly equal rates, right? Or there's no there shouldn't be any bias either, either way. On the other hand, given what we know from what people can learn about these kinds of patterns in the lab, we expect that a harmonic learner should infer some kind of phonotactic constraint, given the fact that in the lexicon, they don't ever actually see right, um, non-harmonic or disharmonic stems. Right? So you should always prefer GK over GIKO. Right? So what did we find? Um, so this is, what, this is a, a, a plot that shows you the proportion of harmonic responses, so a proportion they sort of preferred GK, right, over um, non-harmonic uh, responses GK uh, by language, right? Um, so this is um, organized by non-harmonic to harmonic. Right? Uh, we modeled this using sort of logistic regression, but we also modeled it in two ways, just because we wanted, we were interested to sort of answer two different aspects of the question. Um, and so the main things to take note of here is the fact that harmonic learners overall Right, inferred the phonotactic constraints. So the individual dots here just represent the black dots and represent just individual participant responses. Uh, the reds are the means with confidence intervals. Um, 
and 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 the solid black line at 50 is just a chance, right? Given that it's a, it's a two alternate force choice, right? So harmonic learners were significantly above chance, right? Um, in their preference for um, harmonic items, right? Uh, whereas uh, non-harmonic learners, so on the far left, right, uh, were had no such preference. So so as far as they were concerned, they were kind of picking and choosing uh, randomly, right? At least in a loose sense. Right. And this is what we expect, right? To the most, for the most part, we expected we would have expected this to be the case, right? Um, so what this tells us then is that kind of the basic manipulation works um, it, because, well, we have different phonotactic learning outcomes based on what we manipulated in some ways. Uh, I will say there was no category, so the statistical difference between the this, this semi-harmonic and non-harmonic languages. Um, this is a question that uh, feel free to ask again. It's an interesting problem. Um, and, and what this means, I'm, you know, we're, I'm still trying to think through, but, but, but for the most part, again, focusing just on the extremes, right, there was a clear difference. Um, so this sets it up to then ask about, well, what happens with alternation learning, right? So in the alternation learning task, uh, this is, or the testing aspect of this, they were, um, this is a traditional web test in the artificial grammar paradigm, right? And um, as with many experiments, we gave them first a, um, a singular image, something like Kobo, a single elephant, say. Uh, and then they saw two elephants and then were played two possibilities. So in this case, uh, Kobo me and Kobo me, right? So two of the possible plurals, right? And they were just asked to pick the correct word, right? In this case, the correct plural. Um, and in all these cases, just bec because of the fact that the, 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 some of the stems were quite different across uh, in learning, right? Um, all the singulars in this case were always harmonic, right? This is legal in, in all three languages, right? To sort of take away from that issue. So what is the prediction here? Or well, what are the possible outcomes here? So let's just remember that there is evidence um, for alternations in all three languages. And the evidence is actually exactly the same, at least at the morphological boundary, right? It's 100% alternate, alternating, right? So unlike actually in the previous test phase where depending on the language actually there was the, the differences the, there was not really a good way of thinking about the correct answer and in this phase there is actually a correct response across all three languages right the correct response is always going to be the harmonic plural right in none of these languages do they ever see evidence for a disharmonic plural at least a disharmonic plural in the way that we see here right so um, if phonotactic and alternation learning are separate right that is to say a learner is somehow being in this paradigm is able to keep track of the, the, the of, of the alternation as well as the phonotactics and encode them somehow in their separate mechanisms then we expect that this should be a straightforward task right learners in all languages should learn the alternation equally well despite the differences we saw in the phonotactic learning or the blick test because right? as far as they're concerned there's ample evidence for this um, on the other hand, if phonotactic learning and alternation learning are somehow linked, or at least in, even if it's in the earlier stages, right, which presumably this would have to be, then we might expect that the strength of alternation learning will mirror in some way, shape, or form, right, what we see in the phonotactic learning experiment. Um, and this is actually what we find. So the, the plot here looks very similar, although you will see that across the board, there are um, people who are learning the alternation, even in languages that uh, overall don't allow themselves or sort of amend themselves to, uh, to it, right? So on, on the y-axis here, on the vertical axis, um, instead of proportion harmonic responses, it's just proportion correct responses, right? It's exactly the same, but in this case, it's, it's helpful to think about it as proportion correct because there is a correct answer, right? So how many times did they choose Kobomu over Kobomi, right? And Kobomi in this case is ungrammatical as far as they're concerned, right? We've modeled this in exactly the same way, right? Uh, and the upshot is that harmonic learners learn the alternation, um, Non-harmonic learners on the whole, right, if you take it as a population, right, did it, right? They were more sort of, they're not significantly different from chance. And certainly, harmonic learners did it better than the non-harmonic learners. Again, individual non-harmonic learners, as you can see here, right, did learn the alternation, right? But on the whole, they, they didn't do so well, right? Um, and this is instead, right, this is in spite of the fact that there's 100% alternation, right, across all three languages, right? Overall, we find that if we just take the three languages, um, the strength of alternation seems numerically proportional to what, um, to what they see in the, in, in the lexicon. Right. Um, interestingly, again, right, we didn't actually find, we find mostly the differences being driven by 
um, the harmonic versus non-harmonic, the semi-harmonic, even though it's sort of in between, it's not significantly different from the non-harmonic case. Um, again, interesting point, Come, feel free to ask me about it. So just to kind of um, uh, take stock of where we are at then, what we find is that harmonic language learners learned a constraint, um, a phonotactic constraint, which we expected, and they also successfully learned a phonological alternation, right? Um, the non-harmonic learners, which is kind of uh, what we, the crucial test group here, right? They did not learn a phonotactic constraint and that was expected, right? They didn't have any evidence for that. Um, but they underlearned the alternation, right? That is to say, in spite of there being evidence for this, right? They didn't actually quite learn it, at least on the whole. Uh, and remember, the non-harmonic language here was, it was actually modeled after the Turkish vowel harmony derived environment case, right? So what this suggests to us, um, at least at present, is that alternations in these, these derived environment patterns, i.e. the non-harmonic language, are potentially harder to learn, right? Um, and this, going back to the broader pictures, might su support um, or, or at least provide some data to support the claim that there is a close relationship between phonotactics and alternation learning, and, uh, and by, by kind of implication in the grammar more generally. So given that, right, we, we're sort of now in a bit of a conundrum. Um, the fact is what, we're, what, we've, what I'm suggesting here is that these derived environment patterns are harder to learn, but obviously we do see these patterns in the wild, right? The fact is we know that these kinds of languages exist, right? These kinds of non-harmonic, i.e derived environment patterns do exist in the wild. Uh, I've shown you Turkish vowel harmony already, Korean palatalization um, is an example which we'll delve into next. Finnish assimilation is the classic case that, that is often trotted out as, as a textbook example of derived environment effects and so on and so forth. Right? So uh, in the next half of this talk or the next part of this talk, um, what I'm going to actually look at is, is sort of looking more at these patterns or at least an example of these patterns in more detail and what this can tell us about how we should be modeling them and, and, and how languages might actually, should actually look. So uh, we're going to take a look at another example uh, and here in this case from Korean. Um, so Korean penalization um, involves a, an alternation across a morphological boundary. In this case, alveolar stops um, alternate to um, some kind of palatal, right, before uh, e and ya, right, so before the high front four chords, right, across a morphological boundary. So we're like, ma, ma, um, mat plus e becomes mat g, right, and so forth. Uh, and so you can think of this as a constraint against ti sequences, right, if you're thinking about it from, from constraint perspectives. Uh, and in the same way that, that in the Turkish case you get this mismatch, in, in Korean, um, the sequences, exactly the sequences that are involved in the alternation are actually attested within steps, right. In fact, you have this pair between um, mat plus e, which is morphologically complex, alternating, but the same underlying sequence, which is not morphologically complex, uh, being attested, right? So machi versus mati, right, for joint. Um, so the so question is essentially what's going on in these patterns exactly? Right? Um, because as far as we can tell, um, this, the alternation, that is to say the, the, pal the palatalization alternation across the morphological boundary is mostly productive at least in, at the suffix boundary. There's other things that go on in compounding, but say in the suffix boundary, Right? This, is, this is, as far as I can tell, right, productive. So the question here is, well, what's going on if, if we find that derived environment effects um, are going to be, alternations are going to be hard to learn, right? What's actually going on in the phonotactics, right? What, what, what might we actually expect to see um, in the lexicon, right? So really the question is, how much of a mismatch is there really between the phonotactics and alternations? Right. So in Korean, right, put it differently, put it differently, right, are words with TI completely phonotactically well formed, as we might expect or might assume given just the basic assumptions that people often bring to analyzing these patterns. Uh, so uh, what I did was a corpus study of um, a Korean lexicon or the best estimate of a Korean lexicon, and this was a corpus from the National Academy of Korean Language. Uh, it's about 53,000 uh, Korean words. Uh, these are all uh, not inflected, so they are, they are, they are, uh, they contain morphologically complex but derivational morphemes, as far as I can tell, um, and includes words across um, the different lexical strata, so native, Sino-Korean, and long words, right? Um, so these are pre-processed and then sort of um, uh, we're using a pre-existing algorithm so that we could actually query this and, and run, run scripts on this. 
Um, and so the first thing that I was going to do was just check, well, just looking at raw lexical counts, out of 53,000 words, right, how many words actually show um, TI sequences? And, and is there kind of, is this evenly distributed across the strata? Right, that was another question that, that one can ask. So let's have a look. Um, so how, out of, this is, again, bearing in mind 53,000 possible words in the lexicon. Uh, what we have here is just a table of CB text, so the entire series of coronal stops, right, including the, the, the tense version, which, which is rarer in this case anyway, right, um, by, by strata, right. So, so it was important to kind of look and see right, the details of is this something that um, seems to only occur within some aspects of the lexicon in Korean, or is it something more general, right. And what we can see is that out of, out of a very large number of words, right, um, this, they, only about 400 of these occur actually with TI, right? Uh, and even, even within this, most of these are actually loan words, right? So, so say, you know, 65% or so, right? Um, and so it's really in loan words that kind of seem to be where this is happening, right? Uh, and at least a sense, at least in self-reporting of, of informal observation, um, of my initial you know, query of Korean speakers, and I know there are a few among you here, right? And you can tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, but these are these the, the intuition is that these are rare. These are rare sequences, right? And they tend to be. If I hear this, it's, it it cues me that this is a long word for the most part, right? Um, and so, so just thinking about lexical counts, right? These seem to be very rare. Right. Um, so the question is, well, how, how rare exactly? If we consider just all the, you know, the general co-occurrence probabilities, right? Um, and, and does this then translate into, um, translate into an actual possible learning of a constraint, right? Um, so what I have here now is calculations of the observed versus expected um, observations, right? Of, of the cardinal stops and other kinds of consonants in, in the, con in the E context, where we expect, uh, which is the kind of context of focus here. Uh, there's a lot of numbers. The main thing to look at is um, the OE numbers. Uh, so OE is the observer over expected, right? So OE being given the independent occurrence of each part of the combination. So in this case, the independent occurrence of coronal stops and the independent occurrence of E or Y, right, combined, right? How much do we expect them to actually co-occur, right? And that's the expected. And the observed is, well, what is, what is actually the rate of occurrence, right? Um, and the, the, the quick thing to look at is essentially an OE value of one suggests something is occurring at, at the expected rate. Uh, OE values over one suggests something is occurring at more than expected the rate of occurrence based on chance alone. And anything under one is less than expected, right? So the crucial thing here really is this, um, the sort of left cell and the OE value there. Right, as an initial indication, right? What we find is that um, uh, the occurrence of these uh, sequences to TI sequences, so precisely the sequences which um, are involved in, in the alternation, right, are actually exceedingly rare, uh, given the fact that both T and U, right, occur quite frequently in the lexicon. So they're occurring at about a 10th or less than 10% rate that we expect, right? Um, so the OE value is very low. Right? So that is to say, they're rare. Right. They're rarer than expected. Um, and actually, if you look at a, at a, at a corpus of child-directed speech, right, if you want to think about, okay, what, is the, um, what does the input look like? Uh, this also is, a, we should see a similar pattern. Right. Um, so does this actually translate to the learning of some kind of grammatical constraint, right? Um, is this under representation that we've just seen? So it occurs less than expected. Does it actually sufficient for a, a computational learner, I should say, right, to pick up on, pick up on this. Um, and so what we did was uh, we chucked, the, chucked this data into uh, the implemented phonotactic learner from Hayes and Wilson. Uh, this uses a weighted constraint model. Um, and it, the main thing to say is it assesses phonotactic legality from surface forms, right? Um, I won't kind of go through the, the details of this, but the most important thing to say is this. What, what it spits out is a higher weight which is a higher penalty for particular sequences, right? So the higher the weight is, the more the kind of the um, more worse or worser, if that makes sense, um, the particular sequences. So the learning data for this data set was the, the entire corpus. Um, um, we just did the entire corpus in um, noisy uninflected forms, as I said, 
Uh, but I included this native Sino Korean and lower lexicons all together because, as far as, say, a child goes, right, the, these things don't come tacked, right? So, part of what I was interested in was even if I put all of this in, what actually ends up happening, right? Um, let's go there. And so, what did we find? I'm going to just skip this because this is, feel free to ask me more about the parameters, but we, they were looked at, looking to find environment constraints, but the parameters that we did here were things just following Hayes and Wilson, so the original paper. So nothing particularly, you know, um, that there was not default. So what did we find? And this is a crucial part, right? Just as a sanity check, the, the, the grammar assigns things that we expect based on what we know from current Inferno tactics, right? So uh, no glides were initially, um, the co-occurrence of, of, of uh, laryngeal stops and so forth. But crucially, it does assign a penalty to TI forms, right? So it assigns a penalty of about, you know, just under two, which just to get, in terms of put it in context, this is, a, is, is comparable to constraints against the or th or th or onsets in English from Hayes and Wilson. And what this just suggests is that these sequences are rare, but that the constraint is violable, right? So it's, it's not a categorical thing, it's really a stochastic one. Right. But nonetheless, it, it's the, the unattestedness or underrepresentation, rather, right, seems to translate into some kind of penalty. Right. These forms are not exactly like super great. Right. Um, so what this means then is that at least from a computational perspective, again, this is this is going to be something that might, the big caveat here, right? The phonotactic learner does pick up on the underrepresentation, right, and it translates into some kind of constraint, right, that penalizes these sequences that are actually involved in the alternation, right? Um, and the empirical prediction, which awaits oh, testing, is that the Korean speakers will somehow show a, a, a gradient dispreference uh, to, towards subsequences in a phonotactic test, right? Um, but the, for the purposes of the learning question, right, it's possible then that having this constraint against TI in place, despite the fact we do have sequences which, are, which exhibit this, can then later aid the learning of the alternation. Um, so, perhaps then, Korean colonization is not really one of these disharmonic cases or non-harmonic cases, but really one of the kind of semi-harmonic cases, potentially. So, do we actually see then languages that are truly non-harmonic in the sense of a mismatch between alternations and phonotactics, and what do these actually look like? Um, I like to argue that Turkish vela deletion, which has also been talked about as a derived environment effect, is an example of this. And this is going to be a sort of a quicker uh, part of the talk, hopefully. Um, so in Turkish, uh, suffix, in the suffix boundaries, um, the velars delete between vowels. So this is a really well-known pattern, but deletion does not occur within steps. Right. Um, the long and short of this, we did exactly the same corpus data set and a phonotactic learning uh, modeling. And the, the long and short of it is this. Uh, Intervocalic velars are not underrepresented in the lexicon, and the phonotactic learning does not actually learn a markedness constraint. Right. So as far as Turkish is concerned, Right, within stems, these are totally fine. Right, so the question now turns to what, what's going on at the boundaries. And what we find, and this is not new to me, this is something that has been reported in the literature but is often sort of not discussed, is the fact that velar deletion is really highly morphologically conditioned. It's only confined to polysyllabic nouns, and even here the alternation is variable. And in my own examination, there are different alternation rates depending on the suffix and root. Right, so it's highly, highly stochastic. Right. Um, and it doesn't occur with monosyllabic nouns, it doesn't occur with verbs, it doesn't occur with k when the k is suffix initial, right? So where, where you might expect it to occur, it doesn't actually occur. So the empirical prediction is that Turkish speakers will show uh, more constrained productivity for a deletion beyond the cases that have already been tested. So, so essentially, there's much more going on in the alternations, and it's far less general, right? Um, so I'm suggesting here today then that Turkish Vila deletion is kind of in this camp of more in the disharmonic case, whereas Korean penalization is kind of something in between. So I promise to sort of, sort of start this talk by thinking about, okay, what does this mean for derived environment effects? So what this suggests for one is that these patterns, once you actually look in more detail, right, at what's going on, that these are not a unified phenomenon in a way that I think previous analyses have tried to account for it. In Korean, there's a weak phonotactic generalization and the alternation is there, right? In Turkish, there's no phonotactic generalization, but, and while there is an alternation, it's highly morphologically conditioned, right? So just to take stock here, right? What this tells us, what the two studies we've seen so far tell us is that A, derived environment effects are difficult to learn, right? And when we actually look at these patterns in more detail, 
um, certain analytical assumptions about phototechnic well-formedness of these patterns that we're trying to account for don't actually hold, right? Um, and from a sort of just narrow perspective, right, um, what this tells us is that none of the things that we've seen so far about derived environment effects, at least the classical notion of these, don't really seem to conform, right? Uh, we, we've yet to really find a single sort of case that seems to be exactly as we expect. Um, and I won't go through the theoretical sort of cases here, but, but there, the, the analyses of these can fall out from existing theoretical um, sort of mechanisms. Um, but more generally, I think what, the, the, what this highlights is the fact that the notion of derived environment effects is problematic because one question is, well, how different are they from morphological condition phenology more generally, right? And any analysis of this has to actually account for the more nuanced patterns, right? So I've included here both the Finnish and, and Finnish and Turkish Valharmony cases, which sort of um, go hand in hand with what we've seen in Korean and Turkish. But I wanted to sort of end by thinking more about, well, I promised you, well, what does this mean for learning, right? What does this tell us? The fact that we find that derived environment patterns are, far, uh, derived environment patterns are more difficult um, suggests that, well, actually, um, it allows us to say something about the model of learning itself, right? Because it suggests that phenotypic learning and alternation learning might actually be interlinked, right? This is an assumption that, that lacked empirical support previously. Uh, and it then highlights the need, I think, to look at more cases of mismatches between phenol the, the different levels of phonological um, knowledge, right? Because it allows us to look and see whether there are differences in their symmetry and directionality, right? So we see many cases of stem phonotactics uh, where, where languages that show stem phonotactics but no alternations, right? These are amply attested and easily learnable, right? But the reverse, which are derived environment effects, seem to be less, less so, at least less, less straightforwardly learnable. Uh, and more broadly speaking, this allows us to then answer questions about the grammar, uh, the, the structure of the grammar more generally, like what kinds of constraints and, and that we need, or what kinds of biases might we need to encode different generalizations across different domains. Right. Um, and because I know I'm running out of time here, um, what also suggests, to, what, what this also sort of brings up is this question of how do different kinds of knowledge and gradient aspects of particular kinds of knowledge or gradient phenotactics Right, and categorical alternations actually play out. Like, how does this actually get learned? Right? What's going on in learning? Right? And what is the relationship between frequency and productivity? Right? This is likely something that's not linear. Um, so I'm just going to end here by, by sort of suggesting some further questions, which are the broader ones about, well, how exactly are morpho morphology and phonology interacting in learning? And in particular, what's something that concerns me is how are domains, broadly conceived, learned? Uh, can, domains for phonological generalizations. Right. And I think just if this is the final word, uh, that I think it's important to look at, um, examine these kinds of patterns from multiple perspectives. So from learning, closer examination of these in detail, um, because really what this helps us with is examining the relationships between different kinds of phon phonological knowledge. Right. Um, I've gone over time, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Adam. Uh, this was uh, an interesting talk. Uh, now we have uh, uh, some time, uh, a few minutes for question, and then we will wrap up and then continue the discussion. Uh, uh, first, uh, she get, uh, Timo Rutger uh, from uh, University of Osnabrück. Has a question. Hey, Adam, that was, that was awesome. Um, do you hear me? Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Um, really love, generally love artificial language learning paradigm, but I also hate them because I've done them myself and it's not always uh, easy to interpret what, what listeners really do, right? Um, and you kind of hit the nail there when you ask about how does frequency and productivity and also learning outcomes really go together. I mean, you have uh, in, in, in both of your plots, I think, where you have a non-significant effect between non-harmonic and same harmonic, there's something happening that's probably likely that it's a nonlinear relationship and it just slowly ramps up and then exponentially um, increases as more input becomes available. So as always kind of, you need to kind of be lucky by the, the choice of, um, of, of your frequency asymmetry that you're creating, I guess. So my question really is kind of a vague question. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. But um, so what, what's the role of priors um, in these, um, paradigms right because uh, listeners are suddenly confronted with um with with 
well-formed phonotactic structures. Some of them they, um, they are very familiar with, others they are not familiar with from their adults, right? Years, decades of experience with their language. So um, what is your thought, you know, how can, we, how can we deal with this? If they have very strong priors, it's probably very um, naive of us to think that they can overcome those priors within a half an hour experiment, right? Um, so I wanted to, to you know, just hear what you think about that. Thanks, Timo. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, so I guess let me address this frequency asymmetry question first. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I think, I think exactly it's not a linear um, uh, relationship. And how to model that exactly, I think, has really impl important implications about, like, yeah, frequency and exceptionality. How does that actually factor in? Um, and yeah, the, the fact is, like, you know, a priori, right, you expect these to, like, follow in some linear way, but clearly not. Um, and so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing about priors, yeah, that's a good question. And so, so traditionally within these paradigms, as you're probably aware, right, you try and control, you try and pick a pattern that's like not non-existent in the L1, right? Sort of to control blank state for that. Um, and but and and that usually helps in some ways because you kind of people come in thinking they're going to be learning a different language, so they're all, all bets are off. But that's also tricky because it, it at least it doesn't always seem to work with all kinds of patterns. This is, this is the issue as well, partially. And, and this is what I was alluding to about the fact that what was nice about vowel harmony is that we know amply a lot about the, the alternation pattern. And we also know that this learn, the, the static pattern can be learned in the lab because the static patterns are harder to kind of deal with. I think there's a lot of work that's shown that um, you know, more or less controlling for alternation, but sort of language background alternations, they seem to be fairly easy to learn. I say this in air quotes, right? Um, but phonotactic patterns are harder. Um, so, so one of the things that we tried initially was actually to, to try and get people to learn the kind of Korean pattern. Um, that is to say, where you give them the, the, the palization alternation, that part was fine. Uh, but then to try and get them to infer a, a, a phonotactic gap, right? That was impossible. <laughs> Uh, that was impossible in, in, within this paradigm. We tried to kind of increase the frequency asymmetries between T's and things, and, and they just, there was some evidence something was going on, um, but, but, but in the end, that just was uninterpretable in the way that he was suggesting, right? Because they, they, they didn't show any learning of the actual phonotactic pattern, which was kind of important for us. Um, so I think you're right. I think, I think I don't have a good answer about what the role of priors are, but I think certainly with, I think this is more of a problem for static patterns um, than, than, all, than the dynamic ones, like alternations, where it's a combination of L1 background, obviously, but also like the kind of generalization that you're trying to get them to make in a short amount of time, which, which makes it harder to examine, right? Um, but I think it's something that we need to figure out because, because it, it does limit what you can ask in some ways, <laughs> right? Not sure if that answers the question. But, but yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Maho Morimoto from uh, Ninja. Hi. Hi, um, I hope you can. Hi. Good to see you too. Thank you for a really rich presentation. Uh, my question is kind of a naive one, and I think it might be um, kind of related to the earlier question from Timo. But um, in your opinion, how how reasonable is it to toggle the ZDEs together regardless of some other nature of the alternations per se? Like for me, it seemed like the vowel harmony has a larger domain um, and it might be more difficult to learn compared to uh, like adjacent segmental assimilation. You might have touched on that, but I, I just um, didn't follow. So. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's, I think, a fair enough question. Um, I, I don't, the, 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 I think this is related to, yeah, no, I, I guess my, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I think, I think that's, that's important for us to kind of think about, um, and either from the lab perspective, but also just like in the, an analytical, analytical mm -hmm. perspective, right? Because I think this is, this is where, this is kind of gets to the point that Timo and I were just discussing where, you know, for one, from just a typological perspective with derived environment effects, I think a lot of these um, 
it may be the case that, yeah, exactly, the vowel harmony cases tend to actually maybe be okay overall once you actually have enough input, right? Mm -hmm. In the Turkish case, you know, um, it so happens actually that even though there's, there's, there's harmonic, the disharmonic vowel sequences and stems, actually the propensity is actually for harmony within stems, right? And the other thing in Turkish, because of the fact that it's, it's, it's highly, um, you know, has a rich morphology, right? And there's the active alternation that enforces that, right? They actually, the question is actually what the domain is that kids are doing this, right? Mm -hmm. This lar larger morphological domain, right? Where it does right, more right. Like, right? In a way that, I, and, and I don't think this is something that people necessarily think about, right? Like what is the domain that the generalization is being helped with? Mm -hmm. And it could be that, yeah, the cases which are like closer together are crummier, right? They're kind of just not as good or straightforward because there may not be as much evidence to support either way. Um, so I, no, I think it's true. I think we, we need to think about more closely what exactly, A, which of these patterns actually end up being something that's straightforward? If so, why, right? Um, is there some commonality between the cases that seem to fail? Right, right. yeah, this, this paradigm seems very difficult to me. I think yeah. because of I that think and also that. what each speaker brings into the lab. Yeah, I mean, look, I think you can look at this from the, the learning perspective in, in the lab, but also just like if we can examine for L1 knowledge in the cases that we, in, in the cases that we see, right? Mm -hmm. So like looking more closely at, at like, I mean, the Korean case and, and like, you know, oh, and to see exactly what are people actually doing versus kind of like right. pen and paper. Yeah, because I think that's going to be where some of our analytical choices are going to be determined, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have more question? Uh, it seems like we don't have a question, but we will have uh, uh, more, uh, a little bit more time after uh, we have the closing. So please stay uh, if you have, uh, if you want to join uh, a little bit more discussion afterwards. Uh, let me um, uh, cl uh, close the session, uh, close today's talk. Uh, thank you one more time to. Uh, uh, both Timo and Adam for sharing uh, their uh, exciting research uh, at the KO ICO Linguistic Colloquium. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, the assistant uh, Migiwa and uh, 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 of course this event uh, was only uh, possible because uh, it was hosted with Shigeto Kawara at KO University. Uh, the event itself was supported by the Institute of Cultural and Linguistic Studies at KO University and the Linguistic Lab at International Christian University. Let me make some announcement uh, about three uh, uh, upcoming talks uh, uh, of this uh, uh, colloquium series. Uh, the first announcement is the plenary talk uh, uh, that will be held on October 31st, uh, Japan time, from 9 a.m. It's a Saturday event instead of a Friday event. And uh, Professor Don Castiriade from MIT will share her research titled Cyclicity Generalized. Uh, for Timo and Adam, it will be too early uh, because uh, it will be probably 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. in Europe. Uh, but uh, we hope to have a recording of it. And then uh, maybe if you're interested in it, you can actually have a look at that video later on. The second announcement is about the third part of the season two of KO IC Linguistic Colloquium. So today was part two of season two. Uh, the third part will be held uh, on uh, November 13 two weeks after the plenary talk, uh, and Kartik Druvasula from Michigan State University and Samuel Tilson from Cornell University will share their research. And that will be on a Friday uh, at 10 a.m. So there are lots of different dates, uh, so sorry about that. And then uh, the last announcement is actually we have a, a six-day prosody talk series that's going on right now at the same time. And uh, we had the first uh, uh, two talks last Saturday. Uh, the next talks uh, will be held from 5 p.m. on October 24th. Uh, it's a Saturday, and Frank Kugler from Goethe University of Frankfurt and uh, Nancy Kula from the University of Essex will share the research on uh, uh, prosody. So thank you all who participated in today's colloquium, and we hope to see you in uh, our next talks. The recording will now be stopped. <laughs>